Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Martin, Associate Director of the Department of Museum Learning and Public Programs here at the MFA. And what I'd like to do is give you just a brief introduction to the exhibition Rembrandt's Journey, Painter, Draftsman, Etcher, and to suggest some of the things to look for and think about as you go through this exhibition. We're beginning with a small and wonderful painting that belongs to the MFA, an image of a young artist in his studio painted when Rembrandt himself was very young. He was only about 23 when he painted this image, but it's already a very masterful and imaginative work. Um, he shows the young artist in a barren room. He has only the bare essentials of his craft with him, and he's engaged in a sort of a dialogue, a confrontation, almost a duel with the work he is creating. Uh, there, I always have a sense of a sort of face-off in this work, and it's a wonderful image with which to begin thinking about Rembrandt's journey, because as you go through the exhibition, you have such a close sense of his involvement in each work, his imagination, the variety of his subject matter and his approach, the way he uses different materials, exploiting their particular expressive power. The exhibition focuses on his mastery of three media. The full title um, expresses that. So we see him as painter uh, with images like this, the intimate holy family from the Hermitage in St. Petersburg on the left, and on the right, a very luscious image, allegorical image of the figure Flora from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. In both cases, Rembrandt portraying figures with a wonderful fullness and a very rich handling of paint and color um, as he crafts the figures uh, out of the um, material. Rembrandt as draftsman. Uh, we have, I believe, about 30 drawings in the exhibition. And in drawings, you really perhaps come the closest to the actual moment of conception with the artist, the close connection of the, the eye and the mind and the hand, particularly in pen and ink sketches like the one on the left. Rembrandt was constantly drawing, constantly making this sort of notation of what he saw around him. We see him here studying a young child's head from three different angles, the rather elaborate hair arrangement um, as it would be seen from different positions, uh, something he's storing away for future use perhaps. Um, and then on the right, a more unusual work for him, a finished study that would literally serve as the basis for um, paintings and prints. As a rule, his drawings are not preparatory. They're just a constant practice of notation and absorption, developing his eye and his repertoire of imagery. But in this case, in this rich, sensuous medium of red chalk, he's doing quite a careful finished study of an elderly man, a model, posing in his studio, uh, a figure that he will then use as an Old Testament patriarch uh, in some of his images from the story of Joseph. And then the third medium, etching, which is perhaps the one in which Rembrandt most fully displays his range and his invention as an artist, but is the medium that most of us are least familiar with. Almost everyone has painted or drawn, at least in kindergarten, but printmaking is a little more mysterious uh, and complicated as a process. And we're very fortunate in the exhibition to be able to sort of demonstrate how it works, because in addition to the dozens of prints that are included, we have four of the copper plates from which four of those prints were made. Um, and I'm showing you here a pair on the left, the print of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Here the figure of Jesus, and here Lazarus um, emerging from the tomb at the base of this great wash of light, sunlight pouring in. And on the right, you see the copper plate from which that image was printed. To make an etching, an artist takes a copper plate, coats it with wax, and then draws through that waxy coating with a sharp needle. Wherever he wants there to be a line, he scrapes away the wax. The copper plate is then bathed with acid. Wherever the copper has been exposed, the acid bites into the metal, creating a groove. The artist then cleans off the waxy coating and rubs ink into the plate, in, down into those grooves. And you can see, looking at this plate, how the dark ink is in all of the lines. Wherever there is to be light, where the white paper is to show to create space or sky or light, he leaves the metal unmarked. And in inking uh, the plate, he'll wipe that surface clean, leaving ink down in the grooves. A damp piece of paper is then placed on top of the plate. 
and the two roll together through a press under great pressure. And the ink is pressed out of the grooves onto the paper. So wherever the artist initially drew through the waxy coating, there will be a black line on the white paper creating the image. Seeing these two together, you have probably already noticed that, these are, that the final print is a mirror image of the original plate. So the artist always has to keep in mind that he's working backwards, so to speak, as he creates the image. So Rembrandt was a master of three media. He also is unusual, really extraordinary, for the range of his subject matter. In the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, most artists specialized. You were a landscape painter or a portraitist or a painter of scenes from daily life. You made your reputation in that particular type of work. Um, your, and you developed a very kind of recognizable style um, and created variations on that theme. Rembrandt does everything. Um, our curator Cliff Ackley speaks of him having an almost Shakespearean range um, in the breadth of his subject matter and the variety of moods and approaches uh, that he will present. So we see him as a portraitist, and that's probably how he's best known today. These are two very uh, thoughtful, sensitive portraits, I think. It's not so surprising to see a thoughtful portrait of an older man, like the print of the goldsmith Jan Lutma. On the right, um, Lutma was a, another member of the artistic community in Amsterdam, someone Rembrandt would have known well. And he's shown here, seated next to um, one of the elaborate convoluted bowls for which he was known. But we also have here a thoughtful portrait, a reflective portrait, of a young teenager, Rembrandt's son Titus, lost in thought, deciding what he's going to write or draw on the sheaf of papers in front of him. And Rembrandt, in this relatively late work, manipulates the paint wonderfully to communicate the texture of um, Titus's hair, the sheaf of papers, so that si simultaneously there is the illusion of this little figure almost projecting into your space um, with his pen case uh, and his papers. And at the same time, the viewer is appreciating the handling of the paint, the manipulation of the material to create that illusion. As a portraitist, Rembrandt particularly enjoyed using himself as a subject. He really transformed the idea of the self-portrait. He created more than any artist had before him. He used it as a means of self-examination, of self-presentation, self-promotion. He played many roles in his different self-portraits, um, and he made them in all media. You see here an early self-portrait from the Gardner Museum, alone from just around the corner. Um, and here he is presenting himself as the, the prince of painters, the elegantly dressed young man enjoying his ability, uh, demonstrating really his ability to represent velvet and gold chains and feathers um, in the medium of paint and also to use light and shadow quite dramatically and strikingly. And this is something always to watch in Rembrandt's work. How is he using light and dark to guide your eye, to emphasize uh, the drama of the scene or to surprise you with an unusual viewpoint? So here, Half the face is cast quite deeply into shadow, and the other stands out strongly. Next to it is an image from about 10 years later. Yet again, a, a courtly, elegant image. Uh, Rembrandt presenting himself almost as a, a Renaissance courtier, uh, master of the arts. And certainly at this point, he had every right to present himself as a successful and accomplished artist. He was now well established in Amsterdam. And this etching is based on a Renaissance portrait by the artist Raphael that he had seen pass through the Amsterdam art market. In this case, since he's working in the medium of etching, um, he's ha enjoying the challenge of finding systems of lines, of light and dark, of shading, to create all the different materials of this elegant costume. The lace of the cuffs, the velvet of the jacket, again, the, the curly texture of his hair. Uh, in some ways, it, you could think it would be a danger that all of this detail to costume would overwhelm the person represented, but Rembrandt's gaze locks us so firmly in connection with him that there's no possibility of losing sight of his personality. And many of the self-portraits have that quality of very intense engagement, connection to us. I think to the degree that we feel we know Rembrandt as a person, it really is because of the self-portraits. We have very few documents or letters from him. We have very few from Dutch artists in general in this period. But it's not words but images that um, bring him close to us. 
Here, two more self-portraits, a very early one on the left from the period when Rembrandt is using himself as a, a cheap and available model, studying different kinds of expressions. How does someone look when they're startled or surprised? Uh, and we can imagine him either looking in a mirror and being able to hold this expression for quite some time while he drew it, or perhaps simply having such a strong visual memory, um, which it's clear he must have had, that he could take this, look in the mirror, take this expression, and then hold it in his mind as he drew it on the etching plate. Um, when you go into the exhibition, you'll see this is a, a very small work. It's not much bigger than a big postage stamp. And it's amazing the presence and the force that it has. The self-portrait on the right shows Rembrandt with his first wife, Saskia, and it may commemorate their marriage. Such double portraits often did in Dutch society. He brings her in quite close to him. She might seem a little, her position might seem rather subordinate to our eyes uh, in our times. But for the 17th century, this was quite an intimate connection. Um, and at the moment of drawing her and drawing himself, you can see his hand holding the pen at the lower left. Um, and it seems almost as though he's just turned from using her as his model to connect with us or to see himself in the mirror if we think about the actual circumstances under which this was made. And again, notice how he's playing with light and shadow, um, having his hat cast such a dark shadow over his face so that his eyes gaze out from that web of shadow and connect with us in the, from there, adding a sort of note of mystery and surprise. Images of daily life were a new innovation, a new type of subject matter in the Netherlands in the 17th century, very popular. And Rembrandt is constantly observing what is going on around him. Uh, these are two of the drawings in which he captures those images. The one on the left of a dog sleeping in his kennel belongs to the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and you can see how he's created this little box of space um, with broad strokes of shadow. Um, that circle around this balled up dog, uh, drawing with a pen and ink more in more detail. He captures the, the shape, the feel of that little furry um, ball of the dog. And then on the right, we have images of children and their caretakers, mothers or nursemaids um, out on the street with children. Rembrandt was a very close observer of children. His children are never sentimental or sweet. They're usually robust little bundles of energy. And you can see the one here who's walking next to his nurse and sort of tugging at her hand and um, struggling along. The other uh, image, the child seated on the woman's lap, uh, was an unusual moment that caught Rembrandt's eye because he has noted above it a little child wearing an old jacket over his head. Um, a detail that he wanted to remember. He doesn't write very often on his drawings, but this is one where we do have that kind of notation. So all of these images would have gathered in his memory, formed part of his, his visual repertoire when he then came to create work, finished works such as this etching, Beggars at the Doorway. Uh, he very often used these doorway scenes, the encounter between the, the sheltered world within uh, and the uh, more comfortless world without. And here we absolutely see that division, the um, well-to-do elderly gentleman graciously handing out a coin uh, into the hand of the mother of this little homeless family. The father perhaps seems to have just played something maybe on a street organ that you can't really see. And he may be blind. The eyes are shadowed and cast into shadow. And the mother, a more robust, active figure, she's the one in charge. She's the one reaching for the coin. On her back um, is this great baby peering out from under his little cap. Um, and then perhaps my favorite figure in this image, uh, the young boy, the son, who we see um, and we have such a sense, I think, of him, even though we don't see his face and we don't see even his hands. Uh, we just see this sort of sturdy little stance and the fact that his clothes are too big for him, that he's clearly dressed in cast-offs that have been belted in around him or hat that sinks down on his ears. And just those details tell us so much about their life, about his role in the family. He's almost like a little character out of Dickens. And often, these, you make these kind of connections uh, when you look at an image by Rembrandt, it seems as though a whole story, a whole novel unfolds. Rembrandt was also a landscape artist um, in all media. 
We're looking here at a painting and a drawing, both quite small, the painting smaller than a sheet of notebook paper, um, a swiftly captured image of a very cold, chilly day uh, in winter. You see the pale aqua sky sort of scraped clean with just a skim of clouds, and then the light reflecting off the frozen canal, which serves as a, a roadway along which people are walking, passing the brown, barren, comfortless uh, landscape of midwinter. And just the body language, I think of those little figures in the center, the woman with her arms pulled in, conserving every scrap of warmth, and the little dog trailing after her. Dogs are often a little added touch in Rembrandt's paintings, prints, drawings, everywhere. Um, they, they convey the absolute feel of the air as he, they pass through this very distinctive landscape. And you'll note in all of these landscapes um, that I'm going to show you, Rembrandt, like other um, Dutch artists of the time, is really celebrating and characterizing the particular nature of the Dutch landscape, that flat, low, swampy, country from which they were partly reclaiming from the sea by draining and um, pumping out the water. They had a real sense that they were creating their own world um, and prized it very highly. So mo landscape motifs that were not really tr tr in the tradition um, of landscape painting of heroic mountains or dramatic vistas, instead capturing this very distinctive low horizon view. And you see it also in the drawing on the right, which is very not much bigger than a dollar bill, a very swiftly done drawing. You could almost count the strokes of the pen here, uh, 20, 25 strokes to create this little group of cottages on the horizon, the sweep of the road or bridge back into space, the fence in the foreground. So very rapidly, he just he puts down enough marks so that then the blank paper becomes the surrounding space and a whole scene is created. Here are two landscape etchings, and it is again in landscape that Rembrandt um, expands himself most fully as a landscape artist. Um, it is in etching, rather, that he expands himself most fully as a landscape artist. And we're contrasting here a very simply done image, a very minimal image that nonetheless captures that quality of flat land and water. Um, in the uh, etching on the left, which is called Six's Bridge, two men uh, in conversation on one of the many bridges that cross the canals of the Dutch countryside, a boat coming up very close to them. On the right, a much more dramatic and elaborately worked etching. This is a real tour de force, a kind of a conscious masterpiece of landscape etching called The Three Trees, in which Rembrandt focuses on these three monumental majestic trees dramatically silhouetted against the sky um, above a great flat plain, again, that characteristic Dutch landscape, but in this case with a dramatic rainstorm sweeping across it, a storm that's created both with slashing diagonal lines of rain and also sort of blown clouds of mist and moisture that may have been created simply by um, leaving some ink unwiped on the surface of the plate by manipulating the ways in which he puts ink on the plate so that in addition to the ink in the grooves in the actual etched image, there are sort of atmospheric effects created on the surface. When you look at this, this etching in the exhibition, and look closely, you can see that it is a very populated landscape, that there are figures tucked throughout the scene, a fisherman and his companion here by the water, uh, a, actually an artist seated up right on the horizon, gazing out and drawing a little group of travelers. You have to keep looking and looking, and you can imagine the print collector, the print connoisseur, uh, in Rembrandt's own time, delighting in owning this as a work he could return to again and again and always discover something new, uh, both to enjoy himself and to show to his friends. The female nude is a traditional subject in Western art. It's not one, I think, that we immediately associate with Rembrandt, but again, it was a subject in which he created some wonderful images. And we're looking here at a drawing and a print. The drawing on the left is a reminder that this was a frequent activity in Rembrandt's studio, that he would hire models to pose in the nude for his um, apprentices, his pupils, to draw. And this was, of course, how you learned to be an artist in this period, was by enrolling yourself as a student with an uh, established master. And drawing from the live model had become 
the core of artistic training beginning in the Renaissance. So this drawing shows us Rembrandt working alongside his pupils, drawing a very straightforward, unidealized image of a uh, woman seated in rather slumped uh, pose, nothing uh, glamorous or erotic about it, but just a very close observation of the parts of the body and the weight of them and how they work together. The print on the right, woman with an arrow, or um, it demonstrates the kind of image that might grow out of such a studio study um, because other drawings survive by Rembrandt's pupils showing the woman in this pose with her arm lifted and showing that she maintained the pose by holding onto a rope um, in order not to get tired. Rembrandt takes that pose then and transforms it into an image of Venus teasing Cupid. Um, so uh, the woman's body is swathed in sort of soft shadows. There are these wonderful bed hangings, uh, tumbled bedclothes around her. And then here is the arrow. And actually, and you may not be able to see it in the slide, but in the exhibition, you can see right by her uh, left shoulder the face of Cupid lost in the shadows from whom she has taken this arrow. And it's possible that that juxtaposition might even have been suggested to Rembrandt by the situation in the studio as a ring of people sat around the model drawing from different angles, and he would have been looking at her from the back and then passed her to a student looking in the other direction whose face might have appeared by her shoulder in that same way. And that might have given him the idea for this playful image. Biblical narrative is central for Rembrandt. It was in the Bible that he found perhaps the richest source of the kind of human interaction and human stories and human situations uh, that he wanted to interpret. and. Um, these are a very rich set of images to spend time with in the exhibition. You see here, for instance, the theme of the flight into Egypt. And the exhibition is organized thematically, grouping early self-portraits or images of the flight into Egypt or images from the life of Christ together so that you're able to compare how Rembrandt handled this theme in different media, how a painting might compare with a print, as you see here, or how he treated a story at different times in his life and in his development. Looking at these two images, you can see that part of what appealed to him in the story of the flight into Egypt is that it is a night scene, uh, that Mary and Joseph have received word that King Herod is slaying newborn children um, and because he fears that one of them may replace him as ruler, as has been prophesied. And so they take the newborn Jesus and fl flee into Egypt by night. Rembrandt treats this in the small painting on the left, um, which is a night scene lit both by firelight and by moonlight. You can see the moon just about to emerge at the upper left, and it turns the landscape into a whole range of wonderful silvers and grays and deep shadows. And then the little group huddled around the golden warmth of the fire, the holy family with a group of shepherds or herdsmen whom they have encountered and with whom they are sharing warmth at night. On the right, this etching of the flight into Egypt demonstrates the fascination of Dutch artists and print collectors in the 17th century with dark tonalities, with the creation of deep shadow, because that is a challenge in printmaking. You can't just paint on a dark area of shadow as you can um, in, a, in a painting. Um, that shadow has to be built out of a web or a network of lines, some kind of system of lines or of scraping the plate or of leaving extra ink when you wipe it. There are all kinds of things that are explored. But in particular, to achieve the kind of sort of penetrable shadows um, that Rembrandt does here so that on the one hand, the print looks almost entirely dark, um, but then you are able to pick out the figures of Joseph carrying the lantern and then very faintly behind him, Mary seated on the donkey, just the edges of their forms picked out by the light. When you look at the detail, you can see how all of this darkness and shadow is created <clears throat> by networks of lines, of hatching, of varying density. Um, the panes of, of the lantern, the, the place, the source of light, it's probably almost the only place, really the only place on the plate where there are no lines, where the copper is wiped absolutely clean so that the white of the paper makes those brilliant patches of light that then shed all these varying degrees of light over the forms in the, um, in the print. 
the entire print is probably only about as big as a postcard. Um, so the detail here is a great enlargement. Uh, we're actually offering magnifying glasses, inexpensive magnifying glasses, um, at the entrance to the exhibition for people who want to really uh, get a magnified view of how Rembrandt used those details and those systems of lines in uh, printmaking to achieve his effects. Here we have perhaps the best known biblical story, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, um, eat, being tempted by Satan to eat the apple the, from the forbidden tree of knowledge. And this is a wonderful demonstration of Rembrandt's humor and of his ability to, to note and represent body language and to tell his story through body language. Uh, so we have these very uh, unidealized, down-to-earth uh, <clears throat> images of Adam and Eve, um, hefty, naked, uh, regular folk. And when you look at them, you see how their different roles in this story and their different personalities are revealed. Eve is already certain that she's going to eat the apple. She holds it um, very uh, lovingly in her hand and almost seems to present it to Adam, you know, the tempt tempting Adam uh, with a sly expression on her face. She's almost like a salesman. Doesn't this look like a wonderful apple? Whereas Adam's hand gestures and the pose of his body, just a study in um, indecision, approach avoidance. He reaches out one hand toward the apple, the other hand pulls back in a uh, sort of um, diagram of resistance. If you look at his feet, one leg steps forward, the other is ready to carry him back. He's wavering right before your eyes. If Adam and Eve is Rembrandt as comedian uh, or humorist, these two images uh, demonstrate Rembrandt's ability to uh, represent deep and, and complicated and troubling human emotions, situations of great tension and drama. There are two scenes from the story of Abraham and Isaac, um, a story that Rembrandt returned to throughout his career. On the left is a print um, showing one moment in the story done when Remb in the 1640s, uh, and then on the right, another moment when he returns to the subject 10 years later. Now, this story, Abraham, the great patriarch in the Bible, um, is commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac to God. It is a test of his how deep is his faith, how great is his trust in God uh, to do whatever God tells him. And so this is the moment where he has taken his young beloved son Isaac and set off to go up the mountain to make the sacrifice. And they have with them uh, the necessary um, bundle of, of sticks to build the fire, to offer um, their burnt offering to God. And this is the moment, the moment that Rembrandt chooses in this earlier image is an unusual one. It, it's a moment of, of question and answer between father and son because young Isaac has realized that they don't have any animal with them to sacrifice. Where is the lamb or the goat um, that we are going to sacrifice? And his father's answer, pointing toward heaven, is to say, God will provide. We must trust in God. And it is Abraham's faith and his trust that enables him to contemplate doing this terrible thing, sacrificing his son. And you see again through body language how he is standing firm in the center of the image, very straight, very upright, very, you know, apparently confident at this moment as he points upward. And this really heartbreaking figure of Isaac with a, a shadow on his face, this sort of expression of, of doubt and, and uh, misgiving. And then if you look down here behind him, you see that the mountain they have climbed slopes off right behind him and that his, the, one of his feet is almost on the edge of that cliff, that, that his precarious position, the fact that his life is hanging by a thread, is, is put before us just in that little detail. The print on the right, done, as I said, 10 years later in the 1650s, shows the climactic moment of the story, the story that's much more often represented, uh, the moment in the story that's much more often represented. And here we see Abraham at the absolute moment where he is ready to sacrifice his son, as, as terrifying and horrifying as that is for him. And you see how torn he is because uh, with one hand he's covering Isaac's eyes. You know, he can't bear for him to see this terrible thing. The tenderness of the father is there. But in the other hand, there's a murderous hand with the big knife with which he is ready to slit his throat. And at this final moment, God sends an angel who says, no, no, your faith was, 
was sufficient. You don't have to do this thing. Your trust in God is rewarded. You will not have to sacrifice your son. Here is a ram caught in the thicket who you may sacrifice instead. And in this image, rather than you're racing in from the opposite side to stop Abraham or um, calling out to him, which is what the Bible actually says, that it's his words that stop him, we see that the angel embraces Abraham from behind. It's a, really, it's a very loving demonstration, the idea that, that the power and love of God will uh, embrace you and save you, and you see how his hands grasp Abraham's arms and stop him at the last moment as Abraham turns his head um, to hear this message. And we're not sure whether, does Abraham see the angel uh, or does he just feel him um, and know uh, that he is saved? And this is a, an image where Rembrandt uses dark and light very dramatically, very deep areas of shadow clustering around the figures so that the figures stand out as almost a sculptural group uh, in the center of the etching. And again, it has extraordinary presence for a work that is only you know, maybe eight inches square. And you can imagine these etchings. These are meant to be looked at one-on-one -on -one in a portfolio, in your lap, uh, to be studied closely and thoughtfully and are packed with detail, um, both descriptive detail and detail in terms of how the how of the artistry, how the material is handled, how the lines are used, what kind of, of uh, textures or patterns are created that someone who was a connoisseur of prints would really savor and enjoy as he looked at the image. I'm going to close with another of Rembrandt's biblical etchings um, from the New Testament. And there are many dramatic scenes from uh, the story of the Passion, the last events of Christ's life, the crucifixion and entombment. Um, but Rembrandt was also drawn to quieter images of Christ's ministry, of his teaching, the bringing of his message. Um, and this is one of those images in which we see him um, in some sort of a large, dark, uh, shadowed building, a, a warehouse, an old um, uh, courtyard and gathered around him an intense circle of all kinds and conditions of humanity, young and old, men and women, uh, people who look uh, well-fed and prosperous, people who look shabby um, and a little more marginal, people who are deep in thought, people who are questioning, but all of them intent on what Jesus is saying except for the one figure right in the foreground, the little boy whom you see in the detail, who is turned around and is drawing in the dust. And it's hard not to see this as yet another of Rembrandt's self-portraits, of his sort of presentation of the artist at work. Finally, to look at one more of those self-portraits, a late work from the National Gallery in Washington, an image that Rembrandt painted um, toward the end of his life um, where many, many things had happened to him. Um, and notice that, again, in this particular image, he's showing himself with rich clothing, uh, with a, a fur-trimmed robe and a velvet cap with a gold chain on it, the kind of accoutrements that have appeared in some of those princely self-portraits over the course of his career. But here they seem included really for the purpose of contrast uh, so that he, he, he puts them in in order to de-emphasize them, to subdue any as that richness and that material comfort to focus our attention on his face and what that face shows us of what he has experienced and what he has learned. Um, he, at this time, he has experienced great financial and artistic success and achievement, but he has also suffered reverses and criticism and loss of wealth. Um, he has married but lost his wife. He has had children die in childbirth. He has only one surviving child. So a great deal of life um, has passed over him and left, his mark on, left its mark on him. And in this portrait, he seems to want to communicate to us uh, what he has experienced and what he has learned. I encourage you to see the exhibition. I encourage you to see it more than once. Um, it's a, exhibition of great richness and depth. It offers the opportunity for comparison um, and contrast for digging deeply into the great range and variety and invention of Rembrandt.